Welcome to the Newtown Arts Company's radio production of A Christmas Carol. Let us bring the spirits of Christmas to brighten your holiday. Spend an hour with the Cratchits, Marley, the ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future, and of course, the notorious Mr. Scrooge. May your hearts warm with the memories of your Christmases past and with the hopes of joyous and healthy Christmases to come. We'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors for their continued support. Anne Costello of Century 21, Veterans Crossing Vineyards, First National Bank and Trust Company of Newtown, Heartbeat, Isaac Newtons, Michael's Jewels, Newtown Business Association, Newtown Business Commons, Pascarella Eye Care, Vault, Curtin and Heathner Law Firm, Rockwood Wealth Management, and Cineos Health. We thank you for staying connected to our arts community. We look forward to the day when our voices can ring out again within the Newtown Theater. Now relax and enjoy Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. Molly was dead. There is no doubt whatsoever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it. Old Marley was as dead as a doornail. This must be distinctly understood, or nothing wonderful can come of the story we are going to relate. Scrooge and Marley were partners for I don't know how many years. He was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. Once upon a time, on Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. It was cold, bleak, biting weather, foggy withal. And he could hear the people in the court outside go wheezing up and down. The office door of Scrooge's counting house was open that he might keep his eye upon his clerk, who in a dismal little cell beyond, a sort of tank, was copying letters. Scrooge had a very small fire, but the clerk's fire was so very much smaller that it looked like but one coal. A Merry Christmas, Uncle! God save you! It was the voice of Scrooge's nephew, who came upon him so quickly that this was the first intimation he had of his approach. Bah, humbug! Christmas a humbug, Uncle. You don't mean that, I'm sure. I do. Merry Christmas. What right do you have to be merry? You're poor enough. Come then. What right have you to be dismal? You're rich enough. Bah. Humbug. Don't be cross, Uncle. What else can I be when I live in such a world of fools as this? Merry Christmas. What's Christmas time to you but a time for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older, but not an hour richer. If I could work my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. Uncle! Nephew, keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Keep it? But you don't keep it. Let me keep it alone, then. Much good it may do you. Much good it has ever done you. There are many things from which I might have derived good, and by which I have not profited, I dare say, Christmas among the rest. But I am sure I have always thought of Christmas time as a good time, a kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time, the only time I know of in the long calendar of the year when men and women seem by one consent to open their shut-up hearts freely, and to think of people below them as if they really were fellow passengers to the grave and not another race of creatures bound on other journeys. And therefore, uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe that it has done me good, and will do me good, and I say, God bless it. Well said, Master Fred. Let me hear another sound from you, Cratchit, and you will keep your Christmas by losing your situation. You're quite a powerful speaker, nephew. It's a wonder you don't go into Parliament. Ah, don't be angry, Uncle. Come, dine with us tomorrow. Bah, humbug. But why, why? Why did you get married? Ah, uh, because I fell in love. Because you fell in love? Good afternoon. 
I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why cannot we be friends? Good afternoon. I am sorry with all my heart to find you so resolute. We have never had any quarrel to which I have been a party. But I have made the trial in homage to Christmas, and I'll keep my Christmas humor to the last. And so, Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year. And a Merry Christmas to you as well, Mr. Cratchit. Merry Christmas, Fred. And Scrooge's nephew left the room with an angry word notwithstanding. And just as Fred left, another person had come in. He was a portly gentleman, pleasant to behold, and now stood with his hat off in Scrooge's office. Scrooge and Marley's, I believe. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley has been dead these seven years. He died seven years ago this very night. At this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute, who suffer greatly at the present time. Many thousands are in want of common necessaries. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comforts, sir. Are there no prisons? Plenty of prisons. And the Union workhouses, they are still in operation? They are, still. I wish I could say they were not. The treadmill and the poor law are in full vigor, then? Both very busy, sir. Oh, I was afraid from what you said at first that something had occurred to stop them in their useful course. I'm very glad to hear it. Under the impression that they scarcely furnish Christian cheer of mind or body to the multitude, a few of us are endeavoring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. We choose this time because it is a time of all others when want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. What shall I put you down for? Nothing. You wish to be anonymous. I wish to be left alone. Since you ask me what I wish, sir, that's my answer. I don't make merry myself at Christmas and can't afford to make idle people merry. I help to support the establishments I have mentioned. They cost enough and those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there, and many would rather die. If they would rather die, they had better do it and decrease the surplus population. It's not my business. It's enough for a man to understand his own business, not to interfere with other people's. Mine occupies me constantly. Good afternoon, sir. Seeing clearly that it would be useless to pursue that point, the gentleman withdrew. Scrooge resumed his labours with an improved opinion of himself. So, Cratchit, you'll want the day off tomorrow, I suppose? If quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient, and it's not fair. It's only once a year. A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. But I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier next morning. I will, sir. And Merry Christmas to you. Bah! Humbug! Scrooge left with a growl, and the office was closed in a twinkling. Scrooge took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern, and having read all the newspapers and beguiled the rest of the evening with his banker's book, went home to bed. He lived in chambers which had once belonged to his deceased partner. Let it be borne in mind that Scrooge had not bestowed one thought on Marley since his last mention of a seven years dead partner that afternoon. And then let any man explain to me, if he can, how it happened that Scrooge, having his key in the lock of the door, saw in the knocker not a knocker, but Marley's face. Marley's face. It was not an impenetrable shadow as the other objects in the yard were, but had a dismal light about it. It was not angry or ferocious, but looked at Scrooge as Marley used to look, with ghostly spectacles turned up on its ghostly forehead. That, and its livid color, made it horrible but its horror seemed to be in spite of the face and beyond its control, rather than a part of its own expression. Scrooge! As Scrooge looked fixedly at this phenomenon, it was a knocker again. Scrooge put his hand upon the key he had relinquished, turned it sturdily, walked in, and lighted his candle. Humbug! He fastened the door and walked across the hall and up the stairs, slowly too, trimming his candle as he went. Darkness is cheap, 
and Scrooge liked it. But before he shut his heavy door, he walked through his rooms to see that all was right. Quite satisfied, he closed his door and locked himself in. Double locked himself in, which was not his custom. Thus secured against surprise, he sat down before the fire to take his gruel. As he threw his head back in the chair, his glance happened to rest upon a bell. It was with great astonishment that as he looked, he saw this bell begin to swing. It swung so softly in the outset that it scarcely made a sound, but it soon rang out loudly, and so did every bell in the house. This might have lasted half a minute, but it seemed an hour. The bell ceased as they had begun. They were succeeded by a clanking noise deep down below, as if some person were dragging a heavy chain over the casks in the wine merchant's cellar. The cellar door flew open with a booming sound, and then he heard the noise much louder on the floors below, then coming up the stairs, then coming straight towards his door. It's humbug. I won't believe it. His colour changed, though, when, without a pause, it came on through the heavy door and passed into the room right before his eyes. The same face, the very same. Marley, in his pigtail, usual waistcoat, tights and boots. The chain he drew was clasped about his middle. It was long and wound about him like a tail. It was made of cash boxes, keys, padlocks, ledgers, deeds, and heavy purses wrought in steel. His body was transparent, so that Scrooge, observing him and looking through his waistcoat, could see the two buttons on his coat behind. How now? What do you want of me? Much. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Who were you then? You're particular for a shade. Life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Believe in me? I don't. What evidence would you have of my reality beyond that of your senses? I don't know. Why do you doubt your senses? Because a little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheat. You may be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of an underdone potato. There's more of gravy than of grave about you, whatever you are. A humbug, I say. Humbug! <laughs> Mercy! Oh, dreadful apparition, why do you trouble me? Man of the worldly mind, do you believe in me or not? I do. I must. But why do spirits walk the earth, and why do they come to me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad amongst his fellow men and travel far and wide. And if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. It is doomed to wander through the world. Oh, woe is me! Witness what it cannot share, but might have shared on earth and turned to happiness. <laughs> You are fettered. Tell me why. I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link, yard by yard. It is a pattern strange to you. Or would you know the weight and length of the strong coil you bear yourself? It was full as heavy and long as this seven Christmas Eves ago. You have labored on it since. It is a ponderous chain. Jacob. Old Jacob Marley, tell me more. Speak comfort to me, Jacob. I have none to give. I cannot rest. I cannot stay. I cannot linger anywhere. In my life, my spirit never roved beyond the narrow limits of our money-changing hole. Weary journeys lie before me. But you were always a good man of business, Jacob. Business? Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. You will be haunted by three spirits. 
Is that the chance and hope you mentioned, Jacob? It is. I... I think I'd rather not. Without their visits, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first to arrive tomorrow, when the bells toll one. Couldn't I take them all at once and have it over, Jacob? Expect the second on the next night at the same hour. The third upon the next night, when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. Look to see me no more, and look that, for your own sake, you remember what has passed between us. The apparition walked backwards from him and floated out upon the bleak, dark night. Scrooge tried to say humbug, but stopped at the first syllable. And being from the emotion he had undergone, or his glimpse of the invisible world, or the dull conversation of the ghost, or the lateness of the hour, much in need of repose, and went straight to bed and fell asleep upon the instant. Was it a dream or not? Scrooge lay in a state of uncertainty until the chime had gone three quarters more, when he remembered on a sudden that the ghost had warned him of a visitation when the bell tolled one. A quarter past. Half past. The hour itself. And nothing else. He spoke before the hour bell sounded, which it now did with a deep, dull, hollow, melancholy one. Light flashed up in the room upon the instant, and the curtains of his bed were drawn. The curtains of his bed were drawn aside, and Scrooge found himself face to face with the unearthly visitor who drew them. It was a strange figure, like a child, yet not so like a child as like an old man. It wore a tunic of the purest white, and round its waist was bound a lustrous belt, the sheen of which was beautiful. It held a branch of fresh green holly in its hand, and in singular contradiction of that wintry emblem, had its dress trimmed with summer flowers. Are you the spirit, sir, whose coming was foretold to me? I am. Who and what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? No, your past. What business from my past brings you here? Your welfare. A night of unbroken rest would be more conducive to that end. Your reclamation, then. Take heed, rise, and come with me. I am a mortal and liable to fall. Bear but a touch of my hand there and you shall be upheld in more than this. As the words were spoken, they passed through the wall and stood upon an open country road with fields on either hand. The city had entirely vanished. Not a vestige of it was to be seen. The darkness and the mist had vanished with it, for it was a clear, cold winter day with snow upon the ground. Good heavens! I was bred in this place. I was a boy here. Scrooge was conscious of a thousand odours floating in the air, each one connected with a thousand thoughts, and hopes, and joys, and cares long, long forgotten. You recollect the way? Remember it? I could walk it blindfolded. Strange to have forgotten it for so many years. Let us go on. They walked along the road. Scrooge recognizing every gate and post and tree until a little market town appeared in the distance with its bridge, its church, and winding river. These are but shadows of the things that have been. They've no consciousness of us. The travelers came on, and as they came, Scrooge knew and named them every one. Why was he rejoiced beyond all bounds to see them? Why was he filled with gladness when he heard them give each other Merry Christmas? What was Merry Christmas to Scrooge? What good had it ever done to him? The spirit touched him on the arm and pointed to his younger self 
intent upon his reading. The school is not quite deserted. A solitary child, neglected by his friends, is left there still. I know. Oh, I wish. But it's too late now. What is the matter? Nothing. Nothing. There was a boy singing a Christmas carol at my door last night. I should have liked to have given him something. That's all. Let us see another Christmas. Although they had but that moment left the school behind them, they were now in a busy thoroughfare of a city. It was made plain enough by the dressings of the shops that here too it was Christmas time again. But it was evening and the streets were lighted up. Do you know this particular warehouse? Know it? I was apprenticed here. They went in and saw an old gentleman in a Welsh wig sitting behind such a high desk that if he had been two inches taller, he must have knocked his head against the ceiling. Why, it's old Fezziwig. Bless his heart, it's Fezziwig alive again. Old Fezziwig laid down his pen and looked up at the clock, which pointed to the hour of seven. He rubbed his hands, laughing all over himself, from his shoes to his organ of benevolence, and called out, Yo ho there, Ebenezer! Richard! Scrooge's former self, now grown a young man, came briskly in, accompanied by his fellow apprentice. Yo ho, my boys! No more work tonight! Christmas Eve, Richie! Christmas, Ebenezer! Clear away, my lads, and let's have lots of room here. Hilly ho, Richard! Cheer up, Ebenezer! Every movable was packed off as if it were dismissed from public life forevermore. Fuel was heaped upon the fire, and the warehouse was as snug and warm and dry and bright a ballroom. In came a fiddler with a music book and went up to the lofty desk and made an orchestra of it. In came Mrs. Fezziwig, one vast, substantial smile. In came three Miss Fezziwigs, beaming and lovable. In came the six young followers whose hearts they broke. In came all the young men and women employed in the business. In they all came, one after another. Away they all went, twenty couples at once, hands half round and back again the other way dancing down the middle and up again, round and round in various stages of affectionate grouping. When this result was brought about, old Fizzywig, clapping his hands to stop the dance, cried out, Well done! When the clock struck eleven, this domestic ball broke up. Mr. and Mrs. Fizzywig took their stations, one on either side of the door, and shaking hands with every person individually as he or she went out, wished him or her a Merry Christmas. When everybody had retired but the two apprentices, they did the same to them. And thus the cheerful voices died away, and the lads were left to their beds, which were under a counter in the back shop. A small matter to make these silly folks so full of gratitude. Small? Why, is it not? He has spent but a few pounds of your mortal money, is that so much that he deserves this praise? It isn't that spirit. He has the power to render us happy or unhappy, to make our service light or burdensome, a pleasure or a toil. The happiness he gives is quite as great as if it costs a fortune. What is the matter? Nothing particular. Something, I think. No, no. I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clock just now, that's all. My time grows short. Quick. This was not addressed to Scrooge or to anyone whom he could see, but it produced an immediate effect. For again, Scrooge saw himself. He was older now, a man in the prime of life. There was an eager, greedy, restless motion in his eye. He was not alone, but sat by the side of a fair young girl in a morning dress, in whose eyes there were tears, which sparkled in the light that shone out of the ghost of Christmas past. It matters little, to you very little, 
Another idol has displaced me, and if it can cheer and comfort you in time to come as I would have tried to do, I have no just cause to grieve. What idol has displaced you? A golden one. This is the even-handed dealing of the world. There is nothing on which it is so hard as poverty, and there is nothing it professes to condemn with such severity as the pursuit of wealth. You fear the world too much. All your other hopes have merged into the hope of being beyond the chance of its sordid reproach. I have seen your nobler aspirations fall off one by one until the master passion, gain, engrosses you. Have I not? What then? Even if I have grown so much wiser, what then? I am not changed towards you, am I? Our contract is an old one. It was made when we were both poor and content to be so until our station changed. You are changed. When it was made, you were another man. I was a boy. Your own feeling tells you that you were not what you are. I am. That which promised happiness when we were one in heart is fraught with misery now that we are two. How often and how keenly I have thought of this I will not say. It is enough that I have thought of it and can release you. Have I ever sought release? In words? No, never. In what then? In a changed nature, in an altered spirit, in another atmosphere of life, another hope as its great end, in everything that made my love of any worth or value in your sight. If this had never been between us, tell me, would you seek me out and try to win me now? You think not. I would gladly think otherwise if I could. Heaven knows. But if you were free today, tomorrow, yesterday, can even I believe that you would choose a dowerless girl? You, who in your very confidence with her weigh everything by gain, or choosing her if for a moment you were false enough to your one guiding principle to do so, do I not know that your repentance and regret would surely follow? I do, and I release you with a full heart for the love of him you once were. You may have pain in this, a very, very brief time and you will dismiss the recollection of it, gladly as an unprofitable dream from which it happened well that you awoke. May you be happy in the life you have chosen. She left him, and they parted. Spirit, show me no more. Conduct me home. Why do you delight to torture me? I told you, these were shadows of the things that have been. They are what they are. Do not blame me. Leave me. Take me back. Haunt me no longer. He was conscious of being exhausted and overcome by an irresistible drowsiness and further, of being in his own bedroom. He barely had time to reel to bed before he sank into a heavy sleep. Scrooge awoke in the middle of a prodigiously tough snore and sat up in bed to get his thoughts together. I don't mind calling on you to believe that he was ready for a good broad field of strange appearances and that nothing between a baby and a rhinoceros would have astonished him very much. Now being prepared for almost anything when the bell struck one, he was not by any means prepared for nothing. Five minutes, ten minutes, a quarter of an hour went by, yet nothing came. All this time he lay upon his bed, the very core and centre of a blaze of ruddy light which streamed upon it when the clock proclaimed the hour, and which, being only light, was more alarming than a dozen ghosts. At last, I say, he began to think that the source and secret of this ghostly light might be in the adjoining room. The moment Scrooge's hand was on the lock, a strange voice called out to him. Come in, come in, and know me better, man. Scrooge obeyed. It was his own room, there was no doubt about that, but it had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and ceiling were so hung with living green that it looked a perfect grove, from every part of which bright gleaming berries glistened. The crisp leaves of holly, 
Mistletoe and ivy reflected back the light, as if so many little mirrors had been scattered there. And such a mighty blaze went roaring up the chimney, heaped up on the floor to form a kind of throne where turkeys, geese, game, poultry, long wreaths of sausages, plum puddings, red hot chestnuts, cherry cheeked apples, and seething bowls of punch that made the chamber dim with their delicious steam. In an easy state upon his couch, there sat a jolly giant, glorious to see, who bore a glowing torch and held it up to shed its light on Scrooge as he came peeping round the door. I am the ghost of Christmas present. Look upon me. Scrooge reverently did so. It was clothed in one simple green robe, bordered with white fur. On its head, it wore no other covering than a holly wreath, set there and there with shining icicles. Its dark brown curls were long and free, free as its genial face, its sparkling eye, its open hand, its cheery voice, its unconstrained demeanor, and its joyful air. You've never seen the like of me before. Never. Spirit, conduct me where you will. I went forth last night on compulsion, and I learned a lesson which is working now. Tonight, if you have aught to teach me, let me profit by it. Hmm, touch my robe. Scrooge did as he was told and held it fast. All vanished instantly. So did the room, the fire, the ruddy glow, the hour of night. And they stood in the city streets on Christmas morning. And perhaps it was the good spirit's own kind, generous, hearty nature that led him straight to Scrooge's clocks. Up rose Mrs. Cratchit, Cratchit's wife, dressed out but poorly in a twice-turned gown with her daughter Belinda. And now two smaller Cratchits, Boy and girl came tearing in, screaming that outside the baker's they had smelt the goose and known it for their own. These young Cratchits danced about the table and exalted Master Peter Cratchit to the skies while he blew the fire. What has ever got your precious father then? And your brother, Tiny Tim? And Martha weren't as late last Christmas Day by half an hour. Yes, Martha, Mother. Why, bless your heart alive, my dear, how late you are. We'd a deal of work to finish up last night and had to clear away this morning, Mother. Well, never mind so long as you are come. Sit you down before the fire, my dear, and have a warm Lord bless you. Here's Father coming, Martha. Quick, hide. So Martha hid herself, and in came little Bob the father with Tiny Tim upon his shoulder. Alas for Tiny Tim. He bore a little crutch and had his limbs supported by an iron frame. Why, where's our Martha? Not coming. Not coming? Not coming upon Christmas Day? Martha didn't like to see him disappointed, if it were only in joke. So she came out prematurely from behind the closet door and ran into his arms. I'm here, Father. Merry Christmas. And how did little Tim behave? As good as gold, and better. Somehow he gets thoughtful, sitting by himself so much, and thinks the strangest things you ever heard. He told me, coming home, that he hoped that people saw him in the church because he was a cripple, and it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Such a bustle ensued that you might have thought a goose the rarest of all birds. Mrs. Cratchit made the gravy hissing hot. Master Peter mashed the potatoes with incredible vigour. Miss Belinda sweetened up the applesauce. Martha dusted the hot plates. Bob took Tiny Tim beside him in a tiny corner at the table. And the two young Cratchits set chairs for everybody, not forgetting themselves. Hurrah! Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! Have you ever seen such a wonderful goose? A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us. Happy Christmas. God bless us, everyone. He sat very close to his father's side upon his little stool. 
Bob held his withered hand in his as he loved the child and wished to keep him by his side and dreaded that he might be taken from him. Spirit, tell me if Tiny Tim will live. I see a vacant seat in the poor chimney corner and a crutch without an owner, carefully preserved. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. No, no, oh no, kind spirit, say he will be spared. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, none other of my race will find him here. What then? Oh, if he be like to die, he had better do it and decrease the surplus population. To Mr. Scrooge, I'll give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast, indeed. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon. My dear, the children. Christmas Day. It should be Christmas Day, I am sure, on which one drinks the health of such an odious, stingy, hard, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. You know he is, Robert. Nobody knows it better than you do, poor fellow. But, Mother, it's Christmas Day. I'll drink his health for your sake, and the days, not for his. Long life to him, a merry Christmas and a happy new year. He'll be very merry and very happy, I've no doubt. Scrooge had his eye upon them, and especially on Tiny Tim, until the last. It was a great surprise to Scrooge while thus engaged to hear a hearty laugh. <laughs> it was a much greater surprise to Scrooge to recognize it as his own nephew's and to find himself in a bright, dry, gleaming room with the spirit standing, smiling by his side and looking at that same nephew with approving affability. <laughs> When Scrooge's nephew laughed in this way, Scrooge's niece, by marriage, laughed as heartily as he, and their assembled friends roared out lustily. <laughs> he said that Christmas was a humbug, as I live. He believed it too. More shame for him, Fred. Ah, he's a comical old fellow, that's the truth. And not so pleasant as he might be. However, his offences carry their own punishment, and I have nothing to say against him. I'm sure he is very rich, Fred. At least you always tell me so. What of that, my dear? His wealth is of no use to him. He doesn't do any good with it. He hasn't the satisfaction of thinking that, that he is ever going to benefit us with it. I have no patience with him. Oh, I have. I am sorry for him. I couldn't be angry with him if I tried. Who suffers by his ill whims? Himself, always. Here, he takes it into his head to dislike us, and he won't come to dine with us. What's the consequence? He doesn't lose much of a dinner. Indeed, I think he loses a very good dinner. Well, I'm very glad to hear it. What do you say, Topper? A oh, bachelor is a wretched outcast who has no right to express an opinion on the subject. Do go on, Fred. He never finishes what he begins to say. He is such a ridiculous fellow. I was only going to say that the consequence of his taking a dislike to us and not making merry with us is, as I think, that he loses some pleasant moments. I mean to give him the same chance every year, whether he likes it or not, for I pity him. He may rail at Christmas till it dies, but he can't help thinking better of it if he finds me going there, in good temper, year after year, and saying, Uncle Scrooge, how are you? If it only puts him in the vein to leave his poor clock fifty pounds, that's something. And I think I shook him yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> after a while, they played many games. There were many people there, young and old, but they all played, and so did Scrooge, for wholly forgetting in the interest he had in what was going on. The ghost was greatly pleased to find him in this mood. Please, spirit, might we stay until the guests have departed? My time grows short. Here is a new game. One half hour, spirit, only one. 
<laughs> okay, okay. Let's, let's play yes and no. I'll think of something, and you must discover what it is by asking yes or no questions. Yes, wow. let's that yes. Wonderful what? game. The brisk fire of questioning to which he was exposed elicited from him that he was thinking of an animal. A live animal. Rather a disagreeable animal. A savage animal. An animal that growled and grunted sometimes and talked sometimes and lived in London and didn't live in a menagerie and was never killed in a market and was not a horse or, or an ass or a dog or a pig or a cat or a bear. At every fresh question that was put to him, this nephew burst into a fresh roar of laughter and was so inexpressibly tickled. At last, Scrooge's niece, falling into a similar state, cried out, I have found it out. I know what it is, Fred. I know what it is. Well, what is it? It's your Uncle Scrooge. <laughs> <laughs> the answer to his little bear should have been yes. <laughs> a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to the old man. Whatever he is, he wouldn't take it from me, but he may have it nevertheless. Uncle Scrooge! Uncle Scrooge! The whole scene passed off in the breath of the last words spoken by his nephew, and he and the spirit were again upon their travels. It was strange, too, that while Scrooge remained unaltered in his outward form, the ghost grew older. Clearly, Elder. A spirit's life so short? My life upon this globe is very brief. It ends tonight. Tonight? Tonight at midnight. Hark, the time is drawing near. The bell struck twelve. Scrooge looked about him for the ghost and saw it not. As the last stroke ceased to vibrate, he remembered the prediction of old Jacob Marley and lifting up his eyes, beheld a solemn phantom, draped and hooded, coming like a mist along the ground towards him. The phantom slowly, gravely, silently approached. It was shrouded in a deep black garment, which concealed its head, its face, its form, and left nothing of it visible save one outstretched hand. He knew no more, for the spirit neither spoke nor moved. I am in the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come. The spirit answered not, but pointed onward with its hand. You are about to show me shadows of the things that have not happened, but will happen in the time before us. Is that so, spirit? The upper portion of the garment was contracted for an instant in its folds, as if the spirit had inclined its head. That was the only answer he received. Although well used to ghostly company by this time, Scrooge feared the silent shape so much that his legs trembled beneath him, and he found that he could hardly stand when he prepared to follow it. Ghost of the future. I fear you more than any spectre I have seen. But as I know your purpose is to do me good, and as I hope to live to be another man from what I was, I am prepared to bear your company and do it with a thankful heart. Will you not speak to me? It gave him no reply. The hand was pointed straight before them. Lead on, lead on. The night is waning fast, and it is precious time to me, I know. Lead on, spirit. The spirit stopped beside one little knot of businessmen. Observing that the hand was pointed to them, Scrooge advanced to listen to their talk. No, I don't know much about it either way. I only know he is dead. When did he die? Last night, I believe. Why? What was the matter with him? I thought he'd never die. God knows. Well, uh, what has he done with his money? I haven't heard. Left it to his company, perhaps. 
He hasn't left it to me, that's all I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's likely to be a cheap funeral, for upon my life I don't know anyone who would go to it. Suppose we make up a party and volunteer. Oh, I don't mind going if a lunch is provided. <laughs> <laughs> Scrooge knew those people and looked towards the spirit for an explanation. Quiet and dark, beside him stood the phantom with its outstretched hand. They left the busy scene, went into an obscure part of the town, where Scrooge had never penetrated before, although he recognized its situation and its bad repute. It was in this place that they came upon several ragged individuals pawing through a sack of odds and ends. Very well then, that's enough. Who's the worst for the loss of a few things like these? Not a dead man, I suppose. No, indeed. <laughs> if he wanted to keep him after he was dead, a wicked old screw, why wasn't he natural in his lifetime? If he had been, he'd have had somebody to look after him when he was struck with death instead of lying gasping out his last there alone by himself. That's the truest word that ever was spoke. It's a judgment on him. I wish it was a little heavier judgment, and it should have been. You may depend on it. I could have laid my hands on anything else. Open that bundle, old Joe, and let me know the value of it. He frightened everyone away from him when he was alive. Only to profit us when he was dead. <laughs> Spirit, I see, I see. The case of this unhappy man might be my own. My life tends that way now. Let me see some tenderness connected with the death or that vision spirit which we left just now will be forever present to me. The ghost conducted him through several streets familiar to his feet. They entered poor Bob Cratchit's house, the dwelling he had visited before, and found the mother and the children seated round the fire. Quiet, very quiet. The noisy little Cratchits were still as statues in one corner and sat looking up at Peter who had a book before him. The mother and her daughters were engaged in sewing, but surely they were very quiet. Oh yes, spirit, a place of joy and happiness. And he took a child and set him in the midst of them. The color hurts my eyes, the better now again. It makes them weak by candlelight and I wouldn't want to show weak eyes to your father when he comes home for the world. It must be near his time. Past it, rather. But I think he has walked a little slower than he used these last few evenings, Mother. I have known him to walk with... I have known him to walk with Tiny Tim upon his shoulder very fast indeed. But he was very light to carry, and your father loved him so that it was no trouble. No trouble. And there's your father at the door. Good evening, everyone. I was able to find a lovely spot for Tim, my dear. I wish you could have gone. Would have done you some good to see how green a place it is. But you'll see it often. I promised him that I'll walk there on a Sunday. My little, little child. My little child. <laughs> However, and whenever we part from one another, I am sure we shall none of us forget poor tiny Tim, shall we? Or this first parting that there was among us? We shall never forget him. And I know, I know, my dears, that when we recollect how patient and how mild he was, although he was a little little child, we shall not quarrel easily among ourselves and forget poor tiny Tim in doing it. No, never, never father. father. Never. Mrs. Cratchit kissed him, his daughters kissed him, the two young Cratchits kissed him, and Peter. Spirit of tiny Tim, thy childish essence was from God. Spectre. <laughs> Can something not be done for Tiny Tim? Something informs me that our parting moment is at hand. 
I know it, but I know not how. Tell me, who was the dead man who was so ill-spoken of? The spirit stopped and pointed to a churchyard. Here then, the wretched man, whose name he had now yet to learn, lay underneath the ground. The spirit stood among the graves and pointed down to one. Scrooge advanced towards it, trembling. The phantom was exactly as it had been, but he dreaded that he saw new meaning in its solemn shape. Before I draw nearer to that stone to which you point, answer me one question. Are these the shadows of things that will be? Or are they shadows of things that may be only? Still, the ghost pointed downward to the grave by which it stood. Men's courses will foreshadow certain ends, to which, if persevered in, they must lead. But if the courses be departed from, the ends will change. Say it is thus with what you show me. The spirit was as movable as ever. Scrooge crept towards it, trembling as he went, and following the finger, read upon the stone of the neglected grave his own name, Ebenezer Scrooge. Am I that man who was so ill spoken of? The finger pointed from the grave to him and back again. No, spirit! Oh no, no! The finger was still there. Spirit, hear me. I am not the man I was. Why show me this if I am past all hope? Good spirit, your nature intercedes for me and pities me. Assure me that I may yet change these shadows you have shown me by an altered life. I will honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. Oh, tell me, I may sponge away the writing on this stone. Oh! Holding up his hands in a last prayer to have his fate reversed, he saw an alteration in the phantom's hood and dress. It shrunk, collapsed, and dwindled down into a bedpost. Yes, and the bedpost was his own. The bed was his own, the room was his own. Best and happiest of all, the time before him was his own to make amends in. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. Oh, Jacob Marley, heaven and the Christmas time be praised for this. I say it on my knees, old Jacob, on my knees. The shadows of the things that would have been may be dispelled. They will be. I know they will. I, I don't know what to do. I'm as light as a feather. I am as happy as an angel. I am as merry as a schoolboy. I am as giddy as a drunken man. A Merry Christmas to everybody. A Happy New Year to all the world. Hello. Woof. <laughs> Hello. He was checked in his transports by the churches ringing out the lustiest peals he had ever heard. Oh, glorious. Glorious. Running to the window, he opened it and put out his head. Golden sunlight, heavenly sky, sweet fresh air, merry bells. Oh, glorious, glorious. Then Scrooge cried downward to a boy in Sunday clothes who perhaps had loitered in to look about him. You there, boy. What's today? Eh? What's today, my fine fellow? Today? Why, Christmas Day. It's Christmas Day. I haven't missed it. The spirits have done it all in one night. They can do anything they like. Of course they can. Of course they can. Hello, my fine fellow. Hello. Do you know the poulterers in the next street but one? At the corner? I should hope I did. An intelligent boy. A remarkable boy. 
Do you know whether they've sold the prize turkey that was hanging up there? What? The one as big as me? What a delightful boy. It's a pleasure to talk to him. Yes, my buck. It's hanging there now. Is it? Go and buy it. I am in earnest. Go and buy it and tell him to bring it here, that I may give him the directions where to take it. Come back with the man and I'll give you a shilling. Come back with him in less than five minutes and I'll give you half a crown. The boy was off like a shot. I'll send it to Bob Cratchit. He shan't know who sends it. It's twice the size of Tiny Tim. Scrooge dressed himself all in his best and at last got out into the streets. People were by this time pouring forth as he had seen them with the ghost of Christmas present. And walking with his hands behind him, Scrooge regarded every one with a delighted smile. He had not gone far when coming on towards him, he beheld the gentleman who had walked into his counting house the day before. My dear sir, how do you do? I hope you succeeded yesterday. It was very kind of you. A a Merry Christmas to you, sir. Mr. Scrooge? Yes, uh, that is my name, uh, and I fear it may not be pleasant to you. Uh, Allow me to ask your pardon. And will you have the goodness to graciously accept a donation? Here, Scrooge whispered in the gentleman's ear. Lord, bless me. My dear Mr. Scrooge, are you serious? If you please, not a farthing less. A great many back payments are included in it, I assure you. Will you do me this favor? My dear sir, I don't know what to say to such benevolence. Uh, Don't say anything, please. Come and see me. Will you come and see me? I will. Thank you. I am much obliged to you. I thank you fifty times. Bless you. He walked about the streets and watched the people hurrying to and fro, panted children on the head and questioned beggars, and found that everything could yield him pleasure. He had never dreamed that any walk, that any thing, could give him so much happiness. Later in the afternoon, he turned his steps towards his nephew's house. Fred! Why, bless my soul! Who is that? It's I, your Uncle Scrooge. I have come to dinner. Will you let me in, Fred? Let him in? It is a mercy he didn't shake his arm off. He was at home in five minutes. Nothing could be heartier. Scrooge's niece and nephew were delightfully surprised. Wonderful party, wonderful games, wonderful unanimity, wonderful happiness. Scrooge was early at the office the next morning. If he could only be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming in late. That was the thing he had set his heart upon. And he did it, yes he did. The clock struck nine, no Bob. A quarter past, no Bob. He was full eighteen minutes and a half behind his time. Scrooge sat with his door wide open that he might see him come into the tank. Just then Bob entered. His hat was off before he opened the door, his comforter too. He was on his stool in a jiffy, driving away with his pen, as if he were trying to overtake nine o'clock. Hello? What do you mean by coming here at this time of day? I am very sorry, sir. I am behind my time. You are? Yes, I think you are. Step this way, if you please. It's only once a year, sir. It shall not be repeated. I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. Now I'll tell you what, my friend. I'm not going to stand this sort of thing any longer. Mr. Scrooge, please. It was a simple mistake. Therefore, I am about to raise your salary. Bob trembled and got a little nearer to the ruler. He had a momentary idea of knocking Scrooge down with it, holding him and calling to the people in the court for help in a straight waistcoat. Mr. Scrooge? (laughs) A Merry Christmas, Bob. A merrier Christmas, Bob, my good fellow, than I have given you for many a year. I'll raise your salary and endeavor to assist your struggling family. We will discuss your affairs this very afternoon over a Christmas bowl of smoking bishop, Bob. Make up the fires and buy another coal scuttle before you dot another eye, Bob Cratchit. 
Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master, and as good a man as the good old city knew, or any other good old city, town, or borough in the good old world. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him, but he let them laugh and little heeded them, for he was wise enough to know that nothing ever happened on this globe for good at which some people did not have their fill of laughter in the outset. And knowing that such as these would be blind anyway, he thought it quite well that they should wrinkle up their eyes and grins and have the malady in less attractive forms. His own heart laughed, and that was quite enough for him. He had no further intercourse with spirits, but lived upon the total abstinence principle ever afterwards. And it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well if any man alive possessed the knowledge. May that be truly said of us, and all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone. Merry Christmas from the Newtown Arts Company. We hope this production of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol brightens your days. May you have a safe, healthy, and joyful holiday season. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas. 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 Merry Christmas.